everyone. It's George Kroos, another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I am very lucky to have a uh, wonderful guest on today, uh, Jill Seiler from Gunner ISD. The T is silent, which I just found out uh, before we get on today. And, and Jill is an incredible superintendent, and she's the author of a, a new book called Thrive Through the Five. And I was just telling Jill uh, that it, I was thinking about this days after. I, I absolutely love um, the book, the positive direction that talks about, you know, and, and really not only the positive direction, but uh, talking about some of the things that we, we deal with um, that are really tough in education and her focus on solutions and focus on, you know, really empowering her staff and her students. And it was just a, a really amazing read. So I absolutely wanted Jill on this podcast to talk about not only her book, but just kind of like things that she's doing as a superintendent right now. So Jill, thank you so much for being here. And if you could just take a minute and just kind of introduce yourself and really, you know, a little bit about your educational career and, and how you got to where you're at today. Absolutely. And George, thank you so much for having me. Um, I got into education almost 25 years ago and was a teacher, taught high school, at world geography, coached swimming, absolutely loved what I did um, and really just uh, felt a call to, to move into leadership and served as a campus leader for a number of years and then had the great opportunity to work in central office and eight years ago made the big jump to the superintendency and I've been in Gunner for, for that entire time. So I loved what I've done um, and I love my job as a superintendent and I tell people all the time, I love my job 95% of the time and people are like, that's great. Like who loves their job that much? Uh, which it is, it's great. Mm -hmm. But there is this 5%. Um, and quite honestly, George, if we're going to be real, um, that percentage is probably a little bit higher right now. And I would say that's true for probably most people. Right. But there's a small percentage of what I do that is so very, very difficult um, to the point where I think it, it makes people question um, their competency to do the job. It makes people question whether or not they want to do the job. And the work that we do as leaders, the work that we do in education is so important for kids. And so I wanted to write this book to, to not just learn how to survive those moments, but how to truly thrive. And that was my goal. Yeah. And, and Jill, actually, just like listening to you about that, I think, I think a lot of times when people look at the superintendency position, I know there's a ton that we could talk about, you know, just alone on that position, the perspectives of what that you're doing. I think a lot of people that, you know, would actually thrive in a position like yours, see kind of how it's done in the past. And they have this perception like, I don't want to do that job. I don't want to do those things. And my belief is that you don't have to do it the way that you saw other people do it. That there is a lot of flexibility. Now, obviously, you got to deal with like, you know, boards and, you know, um, some things that people don't like you obviously, to be honest, you can't, you're not allowed to talk about you know, on a podcast, right? Because there's like a lot of confidential things that you do. But I, like, when I'm reading your book, and I don't know if that's true, um, kind of the perspective, is that a lot of the things that I read about what you're doing, I think a lot of people don't see as a traditional superintendent role, but I think you just made it your own. Is that true? Is that accurate? Like, how do you see that role? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll even take it a step back and say, like, even the step to get into this role, um, I had so um, much fear and doubt around that, <clears throat> about whether or not, you know, I was ready for that job, about whether or not, you know, I was ready to move my family to take a position like that. But the one key was I have so much questions around whether um, I would like the job. And I think what you honed in on is so important that, that as leaders and as any position that we hold, yes, there are always those things that we have have to do that are mandatory, but we get to shape the work that we do. That's why I love serving in leadership. I get to shape the culture of this organization. I get to set that positive role model example for, for our staff. Um, and, and then, like you said, move the district in the direction um, that I, along with the, the community and our staff and our board, feel like we need to go. And we've been able to do some incredible things because of that. Yeah. And like the, the, the one perception, and I, I had this when I was a principal, people would say like, Oh, like, how can you handle that? You're like not being around kids all the time. I'm like, I'm around kids all the time. Right. Because I actually get out of my office and go into classrooms and I spend time and not like the, 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 you know, like people have seen this in schools where we have like the superintendent, like entourage where, you know, you don't have to do that where it's like the board is with you. You spend 10 minutes there, but actually like just sitting in classrooms, just kind of absorbing. Cause I'm a big believer in the sense that if you're making decisions that impact kids, you better be around those kids. 
you better see like that what the impact of your decisions are and i know that um that happens quite a bit in your role and i i, I just i think the, the the part that um you know that kind of thrive through the five i i, I think that if even if you love your job there is that negative i think there are some points in my career where it wasn't five percent right it was way higher and i think a lot of times to be honest with you i look back and i think that was a lot of me at that time not necessarily like there was a lot of other stuff that was going on and so like when you like what are some of those things that you see that you know are the are the negatives that you have to deal with that that create that five or more percent and not just in the time of COVID, but, you know, throughout the years. Yeah. So, you know, we all know what we love about our job. That question is so easy, but I think the same can be said about the things that are really difficult, right? It's, it's the tragedy that happens to the school system, um, which you, it is so unexpected and so sudden and then so all consuming. It's, you know, poor choices that are made by young people, by not so young people, and trying to support people through um, those decisions. Um, you know, that's when support is, is most needed when that happens. And so how do you walk people through uh, when there's failure? Um, you know, difficult parents, difficult um, situations, just decisions that you're faced with, which right now is every single day where you haven't been faced with them before, and it's really challenging to know exactly what to do. So there is that piece to it. And I think one of the things that um, that I know I'm, I'm doing a lot of work right now with is just trying to support people through things that they have not been through before. And when that happens, um, failure is is can can happen like that's a part of it and so especially as we have transitioned to remote learning it is this constant trial and error okay i think we've got something good and then we find out something okay we're not meeting expectations here how can we make it better and it's that iterative system um, of change that you know our district t-shirt you know was was your quote this year we know that change is here we know that change is coming and we're either going to go through it or we're going to grow through it as a district and we've made that commitment that no matter what what we have done this week may not have worked so let's reflect debrief figure out how we need to make it better and go at it again next week well it's, it's actually funny you mentioned that because i was um you had asked for my address and uh, I was like, oh yeah. Strange sure. request, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you never said why. I just gave it to you, which probably, you know, we've never met in right. person. You probably shouldn't give your address to strangers on the internet, but I just did because I knew enough about you. And it was funny because I was at home and I was, I was having a, like a crappy day. I was struggling that day. And uh, like, honestly, I like, I've been on a diet and I'm like, I'm like, God, oh, this sucks. And I'm like, you know, I'm stressed, can, can't concentrate, uh, you know, and trying to improve my health. And I was like really having a hard day with it. And then I got that shirt and it just totally like, it, 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 I think a lot of times we don't realize the impact of our work, right? It, it sometimes it goes in abyss. And this is so true with teachers, right? Like, the amount of teachers that, you know, can share those stories about some kid coming back, you know, years later and saying, you know, how that teacher changed their lives. I guarantee it's like one, one thousandth, you know, of the stories that could be shared. And too often we don't actually take the time to acknowledge. We don't take that time to appreciate. So I'll, I'll just say, you know, for me, thank you so much for doing that because, you know, knowing, you know, the work that I'm doing, the stuff that I share that it resonated with your staff really made an impact. And I think the, the other part of this too is, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about that space because a lot of times when we're thinking about that 5%, it's not because of our, of our jobs that we're struggling. It's right. sometimes, you know, what we're struggling with as people, you know, what we're struggling with outside of our job that actually now comes into our job. And Absolutely. so like, are, like, what are some of the things that you do and like, how do you help, you know, as people are sometimes struggling, obviously, you know, especially now in COVID, there's all these extenuating circumstances of people who are dealing with all these things that have nothing to do with their job, but obviously come into their work. And some, like, how do you work with people to kind of deal with those, you know, personal elements of, you know, some of the things that they're struggling that are, you know, affecting how we do our jobs every day? Absolutely. I did, um, I had a great opportunity to interview Daniel Pink over the summer and, you know, he wrote Drive and he wrote When and um, in my last question I asked him, you know, just in this time of, of COVID and conflicting information, all of those sorts of things, like what, what advice do you have for leaders? And the first thing that he said, he said, you know, Jill, there is a, there has to be a premium on care. 
Like we always know it's about the people, like it is the people and education, everything we do. Um, I can have the most incredible systems and, and you know, the best facilities and all of that. But at the end of the day, it is about the people. And so this pandemic, if, if nothing else, has really just shown a light on the need to make sure that our people are cared for. And so, you know, right now, I'll, I'll just be honest, like our 5% in the district, um, which again, we could negotiate over that number, right. but it really is. Um, Five-ish. Five Five-ish. Five, <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe five zero some days, right? But, um, but, but the challenge right now is that we're back in school. And so I have 90% of my students that are full-time face-to-face and my teachers are with them, you know, 100% of their day. And then I have this small pocket of full-time remote learners um, that they're trying to support as well. And, and, and I, as a leader, I'm trying to put supports in place to make sure that they can do that um, and also serve their in-students, uh, in-person students as well. But now as COVID has started to make its way and now we have these temporary quarantine situations, which are now far exceeding our full-time remote learners, now my teachers are having to, to, to work with them and support them as well. And so the leader's responsibility is to constantly have have the pulse on the people to say, are my people doing well? And if not, how can I support them? Or how can we make a change in the system to make it better for them to do their job? Because ultimately it's about students and whether or not they're successful. So how can we support the people to make that happen? Yeah, I actually remember when I was um, working at the district level, I was really struggling with some personal Im uh, impact or, you know, personal issues. And I remember my uh, Associate Superintendent Kelly Wilkins, I talk about her all the time. She just had such a profound impact on me. Uh, she noticed I was struggling and she, she actually coaxed me to take some time off mm -hmm. and to just kind of get, you know, to take care of what I need to take care of. And it was, it really made a huge difference to me, not only for my mental health, but how I, you know, loyalty uh, to mm -hmm. Kelly too, right? Because I knew that she cared about me as a person and it, it like a, a something that could have been felt like really embarrassing for me at the time was something that she made me feel it was okay to take that break because she knew if I if I wasn't going to take that break it could have like a longer lasting impact that I might you know have gone out of the profession totally and I think that really important you know when we look at administrators because I've, I've also heard the opposite where um, basically you sometimes hear that if I, if I can't see the physical illness, if mm -hmm. I can't see something, then you're not really sick, right? And I think that we're having a better understanding of mental health, you know, how it's affecting our job, especially now. And I hope that it's something that we continue kind of, you know, really, you know, having a focus on in the work that we do. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of quotes that I want just to, I, that like just hit me. I actually, when I was reading and you kind of mentioned this before, um, I like, I had to like put your book down. Cause I was just, I like, I, I not felt sick in a bad way, but I'm just like, Oh, that just hit me. You talked about it and you talked about, you know, uh, some of the, the, that five that you talked about the tragedy that impacts the school community, the aftermath when any human in building a uh, human in the building, young or not as young makes a poor choice. Uh, the aftermath when we as leaders make a poor choice and handle a situation ineffectively. And I just thinking about some of those things that, you know, teachers deal with that, you know, really is mentally taxing. And, you know, we deal with that situation, um, you know, and there's some negative positive, you know, through that. But what about the after a part? Like, what are some of the things that you do after those things happen? Like, what are some of the things you do after a student makes a really bad choice and, and goes through that process to ensure that they know that they're cared for? Yeah, and I think that that's so important, right? That that goes back to that whole support piece, right? People need support most uh, when, when honestly, then they've done the least to deserve it. Like it's in those moments where mm -hmm. we have to make a decision. Um, and even if the decision ultimately um, is that, you know, there's no longer a place in that organization and, and rarely does it come to that, we have to make the choice to partner with that person. And it's not just in that moment, but it's following up afterwards um, when any of those situations happen um, to make sure just like your associate superintendent did with you, mm -hmm. um, are you in the place where you need to be? How can we make this better for you? And I think it's just that it's that relational piece. Um, you know, we talk about social emotional wellness for our students, but it's social and emotional wellness for the adults in our system as well. Um, if we're serving them and supporting them well, they're going to be the best that they can be for our kids. 
Yeah, and and like I like I when you're talking about that, I feel sometimes you know as an administrator, um, I I worked with people who were struggling, and it wasn't they were bad teachers. It wasn't that you know they were bad people or anything like that. They were just in the wrong space at that time, right? right. And I'm not I'm not talking like themselves i'm talking they were in the wrong position it were you know in the wrong school there's you know other factors and i think sometimes you know part of it is like we have to have those conversations like how do we uh support this person so that because nobody wants to go to work every day where they don't enjoy it and they don't feel they're being effective and sometimes you know a move is you know a really helpful um space when i'm when i was reading your book i i thought like, I know you wrote this uh, pre COVID, but I know you had probably had time to like edit it um, and add some stuff, you know, during COVID, all those things, right? Like, I don't think it was just sitting there uh, for a year before it was published. But I also found it fascinating how much it connected to, to COVID, even yeah. though like not intentionally, but how, how people are sharing. And this is uh, this, this quote really I, I really connect with this sometimes places like failure fear and faith are the very places from which greatness hope and success are born can you can you talk about that quote um in the context of right now you're right yeah. and we're, we're recording this september of 2020 so yeah. like how people are are looking at the situation that we're all in right now yeah well and i'd say first i mean like the origin of that was just looking at my past life and initially seeing so many things in the moment as a failure. And then in retrospect, you know, you have that beautiful hindsight 2020, you're able to look back and go, wow, so many incredible things came from those very moments that I thought were the very worst things. And so when I look at COVID, um, especially now, I mean, obviously it has been a perspective changer for everyone, um, but even instructionally, you know, we, we have been on a, a journey in our district for the past couple of years. Um, you know, I, I kind of call it like towards future ready. And, and much of that uh, was due based on the reading that we did in your book, um, The Innovator's Mindset. And so we had been making all of these monumental changes um, through strategic planning work, through collaborating with other districts and seeing what they were doing. And so we had been making all of these changes and, and really moving in that direction. But what COVID did was um, just turn everything upside down. And what we had been moving slowly and graciously towards, um, we had to get there in an urgency. And I would never ever say that I would wish um, the way that we had to do things in those first months in March, I would never wish that upon anyone. That's not the ideal learning environment. Um, but it certainly shifted our system um, in and in it just, uh, you know, just like you and I on this call on Zoom right now um, to do this podcast recording, like this is secondhand to us. Whereas six months ago, you know, this would have been a thing. Like how, how do we get into the system? I think so much of our, the mindset of our teachers has changed um, because of what's happened the past six months. And so I, again, um, you know, the, the ramifications of this pandemic have been far reaching and, um, for certainly from a health perspective and economic perspective but you know our job also is to find those silver linings to find that optimistic view and i think that that's part of it is that teaching has forever changed um, in what we thought was maybe not possible um certainly we've started to realize is so the the there's one thing that you and i've been really thinking about this quite a bit because i'm sure you saw this too um and i've had lots of conversations with educators about this is that they, they, they tend to talk about, uh, hey, there's this teacher that honestly, I thought they were like so resistant, you know, they would, and now they're just flying. They're doing amazing, right? And that's just amazing to me that they're doing that. And I, I really thought about that comment about how some of our teachers have that have surprised some people in their spaces, like they were totally against technology, uh, you know, like forget that now, like you have to use it. There's, you know, there's no, there's no option around it. And the reason I bring this up is because I think that we are surprised by that teacher, but really what we should be is like, okay, what was I not doing that maybe would have helped that person see the potential and the value of this? Because I think a lot of teachers gravitated toward those things 
because they always believed relationships were important, but now they knew the only way they could, you know, create relationships was through technology. And so they're going to learn it. Whereas mm-hmm. before they saw it as, you know, just a, another thing. And so, you know, as leaders, like how do we, you know, help people see value in these things in a way that, you know, COVID did for many people that maybe in leadership was not happening in, in many spaces. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that has changed for me, even on a leadership level, was my level of collaboration and networking. I've, I've always had great networks and great relationships, but COVID changed the way that we lead because you are put in this emergency kind of situation where you are desperate to find out what are other people doing, what are they thinking, what have they tried, what have they learned. And I would say that the same is true for our, our teachers as well. Like this threw everyone into this bucket of, you know, 24 seven, they needed to figure out remote learning. And all of a sudden they started drawing on each other and, you know, no longer were any hierarchical structures in place. It was truly who had the knowledge, who had the background, who had the experience. Um, and we just kind of flattened the system and allowed people to, to share and to learn and to grow. And you, we did, we saw people rise up that I never would have um, imagined um, would rise up doing and things like Flipgrid and I mean just super cool things and then sharing it with their colleagues and um, I, the growth that we have seen has been incredible. So Jill I'm going to ask you a question it's, and maybe I don't know if it's personal um, but just something I think about quite a bit and I'm sure you've heard this too right because I see there's a lot of um, comments and maybe negative reactions towards superintendents towards administrators and like the, the situation is complicated, right? Like you look at COVID and there's this physical virus, this virus that, you know, can do physical damage. But then we also have to balance like the social emotional aspect of kids being isolated. So it's not like, it, it's not like just a clear cut uh, solution. And one of, the, one of the statements that I hate, and I cannot stand it when people say this, because I find it almost dehumanizing as well. That's why you get paid the big bucks. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm sure you've heard that too. Um, You know, like, Hey, you're in that role. That's like, this is your problem. You should, you know, like we should, you know, just go after you and we don't agree with your decision and things like that. And I know we have this ownership to so many people and you know, the way we do our jobs is, is really tough. And I know, and I know from my conversations with you, I know from reading your work that at the center of the, of your work is always kids. It's always Mm -hmm. about like, how do I serve kids? So in a superintendent position, where you are at the top of the traditional change who who do you turn to when you're struggling professionally right i know that you can i'm sure you could say like family but like who do you go to right because it feels like that's it you're that's Mm -hmm. it like everything lies with you what do you how do you how do you deal with those situations yeah. So in, in first, I'll go back, you know, when earlier in the interview and you talked about like that list of the really difficult things, you talked about, you know, the tragedy and um, the poor choice and all of those sorts of things. The, the very last bullet that I had on that list was the weight. Like it's, it's not um, the, the speed of decisions that I have to make. It's not the inavailability of funds. It's not like all the political things that are in play. Like there's so many things that, that I have to work through as a superintendent, but the thing that gets me the most is the weight of knowing that I have the livelihood of not only all of my students, but all of my staff. Like it's that weight that is, is the, most, the most difficult thing to work mm-hmm. through. And so when it comes to things where, where that weight is too much to bear, where do I go? Um, and I'm super fortunate, uh, you know, the higher you go in leadership, the lonelier um, that gets. Um, but I have a great network of people, but I'll tell you one of my greatest supports um, is, our, is our female superintendents. Um, and you know, interesting, uh, that most of the profession of education is done by females. But as you look at leadership, especially as you go up to the highest ranks, um, it is a very small population of of women that are sitting in those roles. And so in Texas, we have done a really good job of trying to connect, raise up, empower, support um, female leaders and especially female superintendents. And so like I have a group chat of uh, (laughs) 170 Texas female superintendents um, that we can drop a quick question to. We can, you know, walk into a board meeting. Maybe we need a quick answer answer and opinion. Um, And so I have that large network. And then of course, you know, I have the people that are just, uh, I know that are going to be true 
uh, to me, um, give me wise counsel, and, uh, and you just draw upon them. And when they call in their time of need, you are there for them too. And I think that that has been a game changer um, to see just some of the, the female leadership grow in our state. Can, can I ask you, like, I, I don't, is it, is it La, LaTanya Godfrey? LaTanya Goffney, uh-huh. So is it Godfrey, am I saying? Goffney. Goffney, LaTanya, okay, so it's funny that you actually say that because I saw a tweet of hers mm -hmm. congratulating you and, like, pushing your book. Yes. And talking, and talking briefly about what you just said. And I saw that and I'm like, I should actually have Jill on the podcast. And that was ah, actually, yeah, that it. was actually the tweet that I saw. I'm like, yeah, I, like, cause I, I had already read your book and you know, like I'm kind of out in space half the time and I saw, I'm like, oh yeah, I should talk to Jill. And it was actually that, yeah. uh, that tweet. And so I know she does incredible things. Um, and, and, uh, I, I think is she in, is it Aldi? Aldi. Yeah. Aldi and I see, in fact, she even put out um, a note on Facebook. Um, she's, we're, we're real big into to mentoring um, and especially working with, with other women to raise them up into mm -hmm. this uh, position. But uh, she even offered to do a, a book study, which is anyone who wanted to, to be in that conversation with her, which I thought was super, um, I mean, that's incredible. That's awesome. And, with yeah, and that, that's awesome. And I love that the mentorship aspect of that, because I think that's so powerful to the work that we do in education every day. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to just this, this this quote or this quote, quote you said the question is not whether we will face failure each of us will face adversity in our work and in our lives we will all fail the mm -hmm. question is how will we respond so tell me about the significance of that quote and like why that's so important to not only right now but always yeah i think that um you know there's been a lot of research done too, uh, just about um, you know men and women and in their perspectives, um, just on on a lot of things. And I heard once that if if, if a guy looks at a job description and, and he can do you know 50% of it, he's like I'm all in. And if a female looks at that same job description and can't even reach like the the 90% mark, they they doubt whether they can go into it. And so I know for myself that um, you know wanting to achieve, being successful, we have this. Uh, this notion that it's going to be this this you know streamlined line to success and we both know that that is is not true and i think that the more that i started talking about failure um and 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 fear and the you know the work that i've done to overcome that especially to get into this role I think that there are so many people that are hanging on to that failure um, and, and the fear of failure and not moving into whatever it is that they want to do. And whether that's to become a master teacher, whether that's to try a completely different teaching style, whether it's to move into leadership, whatever. Um, and so for me, it was really important just to share that message of let me be real and vulnerable with you. Uh, let's uh, you know channel our best Brene Brown and, um, and talk about what this really looks like and, and how this is not... Um, the end, right? Failure is, it happens. It's finite. We're going to get through it. And so, so how do we do that and learn from it? I, like, I think a lot about um, kind of my attitude towards learning and, 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 and progression and, and just kind of talking about how you share that. And early on, I do, I like, I started with technology just out of like, that's what got me a job. Mm -hmm. And I think what really helped me with with just my attitude toward learning and leadership was technology was always changing it's always something that doesn't work the way that you want it to work and so you have to like kind of go through those ups and downs you have to do this you have to continuously learn and when i hear someone say to me like oh i'm not good with technology i'm like so you're not good with learning because that's really what it is right like it's like how do you adapt to this how do you change right like uh even even when we were starting this i'm like because i just changed my zoom and you know uh things look different so i'm like hey i gotta figure this out so i just start pressing buttons right and i think we have to have that that willingness and i think that in some ways and as you said of course nobody wants COVID to happen but in some ways i think people are, and I've been saying this over and over again, 2020 is the year of the learner, whether we like it or not, because people are going to have to figure out a way to do things that they might not have done before. And it's, these are, that's a development process that I think is really important to work that we do. And I think that advert, like it's learning to actually embrace the adversity as opposed to hating, because you know, you're growing through that, right? When I can do something easily every day, 
it's, it becomes, it almost, you know, weakens my muscles, you know, my mind muscles as we go. Um, you are a superintendent. There's a lot of leadership components in this book. Is this specifically for leaders or is this a book like, uh, you know, any teacher could, could read and, and get value out of? Oh, I think that anyone could read, even outside of education. It's a book that um, certainly is written from the lens of leadership, but it's about uh, leadership, but it's about life, right? And so, you know, we all have that small percentage of our work and our lives that is really difficult. And so the book talks about first, just kind of what are those underlying challenges? Like, let's talk about failure. Let's talk about fear. Let's talk about high expectations and pressure when, when your whole world is flipped on upside down, which again was written before COVID and like literally happened in the last right. six months. And then I spend some time talking about what are those internal strategies? Like if we're going to be our best, how do we be our best so that when those 5% seasons happen, um, we're going to be prepared to do that. I talk about mentorship. I talk about self-care um, and honestly, you know, just what a challenge that is for me um, and, and some things that I've learned to, to help me be better through that. Um, sometimes it's just about uh, toughing it out, right? Like you just talked about, this is the year of the learner, but it's about not just learning, but about grit and perseverance. And are, are you just tough enough to, to work through those issues until you get to the other side of them? And then the end of the book just talks about external strategies. Um, you know, how, how do we make decisions, um, which teachers are <laughs> lambasted with a, a million decisions a day. And so how do we make sure that we're not hitting decision fatigue? How do we make sure we're making really good decisions? And, and how do we lead through those tough times? And so um, I think it's a book that would be helpful for anyone. Well, and, and like in the conversations I've had with you and, and the, you know, the correspondence that we've had, I know that when you're talking about leadership, you're not, you're not talking because I actually think, I'm sure you know this too, that there are some principals who are not leaders, right? They're administrators. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between the terminology there, but there's some teachers that are incredible leaders who are not, you know, okay. official administrators. And I think, you know, um, I've had lots of conversations about this because I think that in some capacity, every person or organization should le be leading in some way. But right. the traditional concept of that term is like, that's, that's just Jill, like you're, you're the leader and everyone else is meant to follow you. And I know also that from your work that you also within your own organization are a follower in some cases as well. And that's one thing I've been really interested in, um, you know, looking at through like education is, is like, we, we focus on leadership, but like, how are you, a, a, like, how are you a follower within your own organization? Like, how do you see that role, even at, even at the top of the traditional hierarchy? Yeah, well, and you know, one of the things that I talk about in that chapter on, on mentorship is I, I really felt like I was, I was just like a leader in waiting for so long. And I was a leader when I was thinking this, right? I just wasn't at the leadership role that I wanted to be at. And so one of the things I write, wrote about in the book was just realizing like there are people that are looking to you for leadership, regardless of the position that you're in. It is on us to lead them, whoever that may be. And you are dead on. Um, I could tell every single campus, I could tell you who the leaders are on those campuses and some of them do hold actual leadership titles and many of them don't um, and I, I think that that's really powerful for everyone to realize that our sphere of influence is not dependent on our title our role or position our sphere of influence is dependent on the work that we do how we support others along the way and bring them into our journey and so I think um, how you see that play out from my role is just the value that I place on our people and our people's thoughts and opinions. And so, you know, if I'm writing a, a, a note home, you know, to parents that might be controversial, yes, I'm gonna copy my admin team, but I'm also gonna copy, you know, five or six other people that I just respect greatly, um, who have a great pulse on the community, who are gonna be able to give me feedback that I wouldn't get otherwise. And so it's pulling people into the conversations, it's uh, finding ways for people to lead um, that might not be the, the typical thing, whether it's you know in our strategic planning process, putting them over different committees and groups, um, finding ways to get their voice to the table because it's so critically needed. There, there's one thing that you said that reminded me again of Kelly Wilkins, like, She's, she was the best leader ever for me. And um, I was actually applying for, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you, but I'm also sharing this with people that are looking to go into administrative positions. And it was one of the best pieces of advice uh, she shared with me. I was applying for assistant principal 
And in Alberta, Canada, where I live, we have what's called the, the leadership quality standard. And it's like, here are the expectations of what leaders should be doing, right? And she said, and I was a teacher in the time, and she said, take the leadership quality standard, go over what's expected of leaders and show how you're already doing it in your role. Because then it's actually, then it's actually evidence that you're, you're already doing the things that are expected from you in these, these traditional leadership roles. And so just a little tip for anyone listening, if you're ever planning on um, going into an administrative position, I think that's a really great piece. And, the, you know, as Jill is, is sharing, uh, how important that is um, to not only identify that it is administrators, but identify that in yourselves, um, how you are having such a huge influence beyond your classroom, you know, beyond your school. Uh, as, as educators, like your, your impact, you know, you work with how many kids in a day and how many kids go out and, you know, make an impact on, you know, so many other people. And that's, that's really powerful. Uh, the last question I'll ask you, and I, I try to ask this of all guests is, um, we're September, 2020 and, uh, we're still coronavirus is still a thing. What's, what's your best advice? Like what's the one piece of advice that you'd give to people right now? Best piece, piece of advice. Um, so and I'm hoping you're not going to take this as a cheater uh, answer, but I would say this, that, that we need to both um, dig in and get to work, and we also need to extend grace to ourselves, right? So I think that, you know, grace has been a word that, that has been thrown out a, a ton this year. But I think when we really get honest with ourselves, uh, especially, um, you know, in education, we extend grace so easily to others and we withhold it so stingily to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this is a time where everything is different. In my world, as we've started to launch back to school, it, it hasn't been about what COVID procedures are we gonna put into place. It is pre-K. How are we gonna walk in lines together? The library, how are we gonna check out books? Band, how are we gonna play safely? Every single thing has been new. And as a teacher in your classroom, it's the same way. Every single process procedure that has been known to them in how they teach and how they run their classroom is new. And so we have to extend grace to ourselves and say, this is gonna be a learning process. It's gonna be an iterative process. We're gonna get better. We're gonna find out what didn't work and we're gonna make it better as we go. And so I'd also say just that grace piece is so important. But part of it too, George, is that we just gotta dig in and do the work. Like we've gotta find out how to serve our kids during this time because it, it, they need it. And so whatever it takes, it has to be that, that mentality of, of um, whatever it takes, but also making sure that, that we're taking care of ourselves along the way. And those are conflicting things sometimes. And that's what makes this challenging. Yeah. And like we, the, the two things that we send others that we don't take care of ourselves is grace and our own advice, right? Like if yeah. I listen to the advice I give other people, I'd be so much better off. In many 100%. Cases, right? <laughs> uh, but sometimes you get lost in the center. But uh, anyways, Jill, I know that you have um, a lot, to, a lot of uh, work to do you have um, today. And so I appreciate you finding some time uh, to share about your book, share about your work. And uh, I just want to say thanks for um, the impact you's, you've had on me, uh, connecting with me and, and your, your staff. It was really amazing to see all their incredible messages to me as well. And so I know that um, your school district is making a huge impact beyond uh, mm -hmm. the students they work with every day, but you know, across the world, at least into Canada. So uh, I just want to, I want to thank you for your time and thank you for all you do. And um, for anyone, uh, I'm going to leave a link to Jill's uh, book and her Twitter, and you can connect with her in those spaces. But I, I definitely highly recommend your book, Jill. And uh, it's incredible. And I think it's a perfect book for what's happening this time. So thanks uh, for being here, Jill. And thanks for everyone uh, for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Thanks.